Good. Well, welcome. I'm Cynthia Figge, co-founder of Ecos International. Since 1996, I have been working with companies to help them understand and, um, and become socially and environmentally sustainable. And this is my seventh year at FIRE, being in conversation with someone who is a luminary in the sustainability movement. And I'm deeply honored to introduce Dr. Roger Payne. Um, Roger is best known for his discovery with Scott McVeigh that humpback whales sing songs and for his calculation showing that the sounds of fin and blue whales can be heard across oceans. For over 40 years, Roger has studied the behavior of whales, led over 100 expeditions to all oceans, and studied every species of baleen whale in the world. His institute, the Ocean Alliance, has recently completed Voyage of the Odyssey, a five and a half year around the world research expedition to measure pollution levels in ocean life. Roger is a writer, a speaker, a director, and one of his articles in National Geographic contain a phonograph record of whale sounds for which 10 and a half million copies were printed. And this remains, to this day, the largest single print order in the history of the recording industry. Roger is co-director and co-author of the IMAX film Whales, and also um, his life is featured in A Life Among Whales. So welcome, Roger. Thank you. <laughs> We're told that there is a moratorium on whaling, yet you've said that there are no international controls whatsoever on whaling. Please tell us a little bit about what's happening. Well, one of this moratorium on whaling was achieved by the International Whaling Commission. They have two loopholes by which you can escape any law that you don't like. One consists of filing an objection within a 90-day period of when a law is passed by a majority, no matter how big the majority is. All you have to say is, no, I'm not going to obey that law, and then it's completely legal for you to not obey it. And the other one is that you can say that you are doing scientific whaling, in other words, whaling for science, and you don't need a permit for that except from your own country. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is that Japan is now doing scientific whaling. Mm. It is the same people killing the same whales by the same means, taking the same data and selling it to the same market, but it's now science, mm -hmm. and it was before commercial whaling. Uh, Japan, therefore, has total control over whatever she wants to do. The other half of this equation is, you, is uh, filing an objection. Norway took that route, and now Iceland has claimed to take it, even though Iceland did not make this objection within the required 90-day period. So what happens is the scam of getting out of obligations to the International Whaling Commission is much better if you do scientific whaling, because then you don't have to obey any law of any kind, whereas mm -hmm. if you file an objection, the only law you can break is the one to which you objected. So that leaves Japan wide open to kill any species of whales of any size at any time, of any, uh, in any port in the world, and by, I mean any ocean in the world, and by any means that she likes. Mm -hmm. And that means there are now absolutely no controls over whaling internationally. The rest of the world doesn't get in, doesn't even get a look in to the quotas that are taken every year. They're set by the countries who are doing it. Japan has basically won everything. She could not possibly ask for more than she has. Mm. She keeps threatening to get out of the International Whaling Commission, but it's just a posture. It's what's been characterized as, um, uh, <coughs> uh, as confrontational approach, which is sort of hidden. Mm. Anyway, that's where things now stand. Their whaling has to be somehow stopped, and our next speaker, Paul Watson, is one of the people helping to get attention to the importance of that fact. So. Okay. Um, we've had uh, an amazing conference. We started with Dr. Ram, and, and, um, and we've talked about uh, many, many problems that we face. Um, how would you, I guess, compare the urgency of the problems that have been discussed at the conference with the destruction of the environment? 
Well, the problem is, I think you could make a fairly clear, uh, uh, I think you could hold up your side of the argument well if you said that there is basically nothing that occurs in any capital of any country anywhere, no form of legislation, which has any direct relevance to the real problems that we face unless that legislation concerns the environment, which of course for the most part is, is, is ignored. Um, just how bad that is, can be, you can think of it in terms of what does the press tell us about and what legislation occurs which could survive what I call the 500 year test, which mm -hmm. is 500 years from now, where our descendants will, what will they care about? Will they care about whether it was, how many red states there were or how many blue states in the election? <laughs> or for that matter, will they even care if a country called the United States still exists by that title? All they will care about, however, and you can predict it exactly, is that they will care what we did to leave them an environment which they might possibly be able to live in. That they will care about. If we take on the job of making sure that we leave them a good environment, we will be, I think, the most praised generation in history. For never in the history of the world has any generation had such an opportunity for greatness. If we don't take that on, I think we will be the most reviled. Mm. So what is the root cause? Um, I think the root cause of everything is a runaway human population, but not just that, and that may be correctable, self-correcting, so to speak. It, not that. The other root cause is just how much stuff, how many goods, and how much carbon we are releasing, and so forth, carbon dioxide. Those sorts of measures which have to do with the stuff we like to accumulate, and with Japan, uh, excuse me, with uh, China and India now coming online strong, mm -hmm. there is really no chance that it's possible to support, I think, the, the population of the world at the level that we live. It's just a dream that that could happen. It's completely unrealistic. So we talk at this conference about um, three to five years out, and, um, but I'm gonna ask you um, a bigger question, I guess, which is, you know, how many how many years do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a way of looking at this which ties into the human population. It, it's an example that was made by a professor at, in uh, Colorado, a very interesting example. I will slightly modify it just to make it a little easier to picture. Imagine that you have a jar of applesauce and in it you drop a single bacterium. And just to make it easier to think about, this bacterium is going to divide every minute, that's unrealistic, but forget it, it helps to understand it. After 60 minutes, one hour, there will be enough bacteria in the jar to completely empty all of it. So the first question you have to ask yourself, I mean to have eaten all of the uh, applesauce which is available in the jar. So now you ask yourself, at what point was the jar half full? And the answer, of course, is at the end of the 59th minute. And now you back up, let's say, three minutes when seven-eighths of the contents of the jar still remain, mm -hmm. and only one-eighth has been eaten. And now we give these bacteria, there's a whole bunch of scientists, and some of them come up and say, my gosh, we're running out of food. What would be the response of the bacteria in the jar? My feeling is it would be, are you out of your mind? You know, there are trillions of us in this jar, and we have seven-eighths of this food completely untouched. Get a life, get real. This is, we are, there's no problem at all. Now you go, so nothing happens, and it moves up until you're halfway through the last minute, and finally, attention is paid to this. Ever the bacteria fall on their bacterial knees, and they beg their scientists for help to get out of it, and by some miracle, which is so Pollyanna-ish, that I don't even think Rush Limbaugh would buy it, you end up with the bacteria now having, uh, let's say they've somehow created six more jars of applesauce and the problem is solved. And of course, that's not true at all. It gives you two more minutes because in the first minute you take two of these jars and in the second minute you take four of the jars and then you've used them all. So this sort of exponential function applies to us. Our doubling time is not a minute, it's about 50 years. Mm -hmm. So back you know, a while ago, the, uh, the National Academy of Sciences funded a, a study which looked for whether or not, the, or at what point the world was gonna go unsustainable in terms of its ability by those techniques at that time to raise crops and feed the population, and concluded that that had occurred in the late 70s or early 80s. So let's say early 80s. 
that's 20, let's say we'll make it easier to calculate 84, we're just making up a number here. Mm -hmm. Now we have 25 years have already taken place up to now, we've gone halfway towards going through our last minute. Mm -hmm. Now if we could double or multiply by six the numbers of the amount of food available to us, which is a completely ludicrous assumption, nobody would take it on, would believe it, then we could get two more doubling times. So I think we may get half of a, a doubling time beyond. So I put it at somewhere around 50 years, 75 years perhaps before people have basically destroyed the planet enough so that there is no way out for the future generations. That's what an, uh, 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 an exponential function does to you. It defeats you no matter what the situation is. Eventually it defeats you. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know what to ask next. <laughs> um, okay, well, we're, we're, we're walking towards the edge of, edge of the cliff right now. Um, we, we were told that this would be a million laughs. I hope you realize that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's been, uh, we'll, kinda, we'll come back to that. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the Odyssey. It's been four years uh, since the completion of this, of this voyage. I'd like to have you tell us a little bit about it, its purpose, and, and really what you've learned in the last couple of years. Great. We took a trip around the world in our research vessel called the Odyssey. We collected samples from 955 sperm whales. We brought them back and gave them to um, marine toxicologists to analyze. Much of the analysis has now been done. We've looked for a whole suite of substances which are, have such totally unmemorable names that it, for the most part nobody even knows what they're called. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 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 these substances are known for climbing food chains. And just to quickly explain that, at in, if you're on the top of a food pyramid and you go down to the layer below, you'd find about 10 times as many animals as your weight, I mean the weight of animals of yours. And if you go below that, 10 times more than that and so on. So you get about a 10 times magnification of, of uh, amount of tissue, uh, material needed as you go down the food chain. If you're talking about a fish like a swordfish, which may live at a food, at a level of a food chain of anywhere between about four and six, if you take it at the sixth level of the food chain, where a lot of them do live, you would find that what you had was 10 to the sixth amplification of these substances. And forgive me, some of you have already heard this, but for those of you who haven't, I think it really brings it home. Sitting on your plate in front of you is a piece of swordfish that weighs a pound. How many uh, pounds of diatoms did it take to make that pound? The answer is a million pounds, 10 to the sixth. And a million pounds is 500 tons. 500 tons is 50 10-ton truckloads. The thing that's at the bottom of this food pyramid, of all food pyramids in the ocean is, uh, or all the ones that we sample in the ocean, is plants. And these plants are single-cell diatoms. So you fill up 50 10-ton truckloads of single-cell diatoms. You park them in a row. It takes about four blocks. And you tie your liver to one end of it. And with it, you detoxify all 50 10-ton truckloads of diatoms. And that's when you do, what you do when you eat a pound of swordfish that's fed at the sixth level of a food chain. And tomorrow, if you have another pound, that's, you do the same thing over again. That kind of exposure to substances builds up in your body. If you're a mammal like us and like sperm whales, the animals we tested who are at the same levels of food chains as we are, if you do that, you, you find out that you can pass it from generation to generation because it goes in the milk of the mother. So that tenderest of all mammalian acts in which a mother is nursing her babe what she is actually doing is dumping her lifetime's accumulation of toxic stuff that's soluble in the fats of her milk into her infant. And that's, nobody pays any attention to this, or almost nobody pays attention to it. It's a serious problem. It's causing humanity to lose access to fish from the sea. But what we uh, found out to our absolute shock is that there are a whole series of metals. Every, we all expected mercury would be high. That wasn't a new story, and yes, it is. It's as bad as we had thought. Uh, but we discovered a series of other metals that had not been noted in fish, and one of the, or whales or humans, 
and that, or not, not, in the, not in populations eating a lot of fish, and that is chromium. And chromium was the substance that was sort of uh, discussed much in the film Aaron Brockovich. And that chromium has built up two levels which are just shocking. I have a couple of slides we, I could show you which just will give you, show you the results of this. It's, that's the boat, the Odyssey, which we took around the world next, please, is a slide which shows chromium levels uh, in the samples that we got from all over the world. And the, we, we've divided the oceans arbitrarily into 16 areas as we went around the world. And you see them along the bottom, and there's the values. But the interesting thing is that all of them are well above values which are of danger, way above the, 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 uh, the amounts which are r recommended by uh, the FAO, I mean, uh, sorry, FDA. And next slide, please, shows what happens if you take those same values that you just saw and compare them to this strange uh, phenomenon, which is in the, uh, in the area of, the, of Kiribati. It's the former Gilbert Islands in the Pacific. It's in the middle of absolutely nowhere. It's basically an island chain that is as far from any continent as you can get. So it's not building up these staggering concentrations of chromium from, let's say, big agriculture or some river which is come downstream from a factory. And no, you're out in the middle of the, the wild blue yonder, and you get these incredibly high concentrations of, of uh, chromium. Next slide shows uh, that it takes about 10 micromoles. You don't, it doesn't just kill whales. You can also break up uh, the chromosomes during division, and you see about 10 micromolar is enough to do it. And look at the concentrations in the middle in tissue levels. You're getting up around Kiribati to 50 times this dose which breaks uh, chromosomes. Why that's important is that's what cancer is very often initiated by. Next slide is the final one, which uh, somehow we've lost it anyway. Oh, maybe it's, oh, here we come. Yes, sorry. Um, it, it's pointing out the fact that what we are finding as concentrations in these whales is in fact, equal to 20 years of occupational chromium exposure, which you usually only see in lung cancer patients who have, who have died as a result of that exposure by working in factories. I mean, this is really a problem. And it's just one of many of the substances which are bothering these animals. So what I think we learn from this is that humanity is on the verge of losing access to fish from the sea of the species of many species that we most prefer to eat. And how serious is that? It fish, or seafood, I should say, is the primary source of animal protein for about a billion people in the world. I think you could make, sorry, a pretty strong case to say it's maybe one of the biggest public health threats facing humanity. It's on nobody's radar. Nobody's paying any attention to it. And, uh, but we hope to try to change that. We're trying to get as much exposure to these results out into the world so something can be done about it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Roger uh, recently spoke at a, at a conference called the Blue Visions Summit and sent me a speech. And I've asked him if he would uh, if he'd talk a little bit about um, a couple of things that were in that speech. One is that he said, uh, global warming is but the tip of a giant iceberg of chilling problems for which we must have at least as much concern as we do for global warming. Um, in, that, in that keynote, um, Roger listed uh, what some of these things below the, the tip are, and I was wondering if you would go ahead and share, share that right. with us. I've I brought the list. I was warned about this. Um, I'm just going to quickly go at, over it. These are all things which are... Uh, are, are tremendous threats to the health of the seas. The removal of hundreds of millions of tons of wildlife, obviously, from the seas. The rapid evolution of fish diseases, which are promoted by fish farming. Genetic swamping of tiny populations of fish whenever there's an escape of farmed fish. The 10 to 1 ratio of wild fish which are needed to produce farmed fish. The bycatch of unwanted fish that's thrown away, even though it may be 50 to 100 times the catch that's kept and sent to market. Those are not exaggerations, by the way. Invasive species that damage the ecosystem, the transport of invasive species in the ballast water of ships, the exchange of invasive species between oceans using sea level canals, the extinction of species currently at the highest rate in 60 million years at least, 
the consumption of sea turtles that take 50 years to reach sexual maturity, of fish like sea bass, rockfish, and sharks that may be 50 years old before they reproduce, or the orange ruffy, which may live to be 200 years old and is also comes, uh, produces young at a very late date. The consumption of endangered species like the bluefin tuna, I think the most magnificent fish in the sea, now getting close to extinction. The Pacific gyre of plastic trash, which has been dubbed plastic soup, or more irreverently, the toilet that can't be flushed. The spillage of oil during the drilling for undersea wells, during extraction, during flaring of gas, during transport. The devastating noise levels from military sonars, super tankers, and particularly from air guns, which are used in seismic surveys. The development of fishing technologies that no species reproductive rate can possibly keep up with. Drift nets, gill nets, and giant purse seines, fish traps made from the indestructible plastics, which, when they break free and keep, keep rebaiting themselves with the fish that come to eat the victims in the, of the trap and become bait themselves. <coughs> long lines, 50 miles long or longer, containing thousands of hooks. Millions of tons of discarded fishing nets, many of which keep on killing for months or years. Deep trawling that destroys the very seafloor life that's essential for growth of fish species and the trawlers that the trawlers want to catch, rather like farming with a bulldozer. Tro uh, you could do it, doesn't make a very good crop. Uh, dual trawl operations in which gigantic nets are dragged between two ships, very destructive technique. The overkilling of apex predators such as whales, billfish, sharks, the consequent collapse of those fisheries, the wholesale destruction of coral reefs through bleaching, mining, use of dynamite to kill fish, use of cyanide to collect fish for the aquarium trade and for the table, the acidification of the oceans that comes from the same excess carbon dioxide, which, oh yes, does cause global warming. All those, and that's just a partial list, by the way, are threats which we need to be concerned with, very concerned with, and by and large, aren't. So I don't know about you, but I, I wanted to stop him about halfway through. <laughs> and uh, I felt my chest getting really tight. And uh, it's, it's just an overwhelming list. And I think you compound it with, um, this is the ocean. I mean, as you said, it's the tip of the iceberg. So there's many, many other, other concerns. You and your wife, um, actress Lisa Har Harrow, author of What Can I Do, have created the Sea Change Institute and you lecture together with you speaking the science and Lisa telling the story through poetry. I wanted to read a Mary Oliver poem, but, uh, but what difference um, does this make? Does it, does it, does it help? Um, well, it, it comes from the fact I started doing it because my wife is a phenomenal actress. And when you hear her read poetry, you've never heard anything like it. And I thought, how could you get that voice talking about the things that I think are so important? And we do it together, and oh yes, I make some remarks, and I'm up there on the stage somewhere, but every eye is on her. her I mean, she can, you can say to her, break their hearts, and she can do it. And uh, the result is that you're hearing from both sides of your brain, the sort of more artistic side as well as the more mm. um, uh, methodical and mathematical side, and it seems to get the listening, as a friend of mine once characterized mm. it, in a very important way, and you have people coming out who say, okay, now it's time to move. But I think that it, I don't want to depress people as much as I have, but I do think it's, it's, there's no hope at all unless we pay attention to what the problems are. But I think that once humanity understands what problems it faces, it moves, and it moves fast. It moves so fast very often that you can't even keep up with it. I mean, you don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, I mean, the example I always give for this is when the Berlin Wall fell, what did the United States government say? Well, basically, it all translated out to, holy smokes, look at the Berlin Wall come down. Nobody knew what to say. It all took place so quickly, mm -hmm. that transformation of implosion of the Soviet empire, that it, it, and I think when people finally realize what is threatening them, they move fast. The same could be said of slavery, which ended in the middle of the 19th century by, and, and at the time, at, as I may have said it before in all these meetings, you know, if you had somebody, I can imagine very respectable citizens saying, you know, are you crazy? You're talking about the entire economic foundation of the United States, and you're going to mess it up for some moral reason, you know, get real, get a grip. But fortunately, we did change it, replace it, it made us a far better nation.
So we're at that point where we need some we need some good news. <laughs> Here's to well, get us back a little bit off the, the edge of the cliff here. So what um, what what are uh, what are some of the solutions here? Well, I think uh, my wife did this book called What Can I Do, which is filled with all sorts of examples of people doing work. And while she was developing it, I really had gone into this with the feeling it's hopeless, too late, can't be done. And as she went in, you discovered that there are not thousands, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of organizations out there where people are really doing things that matter. They don't get any attention from the media. Um, it, that's because it can't compete with Michael Jackson's misfortunes, but it is, um, it, it is, it, it has a, it, it, there are all sorts of wonderful things. I should give you a few delightful examples. It was discovered that lung problems follow from burning rice stubble in fields, when the, and so downwind of this, you have a lot of people catching lung cancer, getting lung cancer. And it was discovered, no, if you flood the fields, it's okay, but when you flooded the fields, Oh, that allowed all sorts of water creatures to come in, and worms, and all sorts of things which swim in the water. Oh, that attracted ducks. And pretty soon the ducks had, were filling these ponds, which were temporary over the rice fields, and that created a new uh, 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 sport, not sport, but a new uh, job for the people who owned these fields, which was mm. dealing with duck hunters, which mm. came in. There's another one that I love, which is making beer. It's now used in quite a few areas around the world. It is a situation in which you use uh, mushrooms to break down the lignans, which are left over in the material, the mash, which is left over after beer has been extracted. And then you take that and you, uh, you can put it into a, into a place where you collect the gas, which comes off it as it decomposes. And that is, and you can use the, the, the gas to spin a generator and, and uh, generate electricity to run an engine to spin a generator to generate electricity. You have the material itself, which you then use to fertilize fish ponds in which there are seven species of fish. You grow tomatoes with it. You sell them on flowers and you sell them all in local markets that are right around this thing. You end up with seven times as much product and all the materials that you're using to give that, get that product are free because he used to be thrown away. Mm. And uh, that sort of thing is what people need to go forward with. I'll give one, do we have another minute? I can't see it. You, uh, we've got four minutes left, so oh, if you brilliant. wanna. Uh, and another one is an example of roof gardens, which a lot of people are now talking about in cities particularly, mm. but there's one aspect of that which nobody seems to emphasize very much, which I find fascinating. If you have a city in which there's a garden growing on the top of the roof, not only does it do all the things that we've heard of, which is helping with runoff of rainwater and, and uh, 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 helping to keep the building cool and keeping the city cool and so forth, it also provides an archipelago of little islands, namely the roofs themselves. Mm. And this archipelago is completely free of predators because the cats and dogs can't get up there. And there is, I mean, ground predators, I should say. And the result is that there are now endangered species which are recovering on rooftops because of the fact that that's a predator-free environment. And so that sort of thing has a very unexpected result. And there's another one which is just now starting to get some traction, very interesting, which is vertical farms, which basically look like giant skyscrapers, very largely enclosing glass. You keep out all the entrance of, of uh, of uh, gases that have not been filtered through a system, and the result is you don't need pesticides, you don't have diseases coming in that can't get in, and a 30-story building of fairly small footprint or, or looking more or less like a regular occupied housing skyscraper mm. can feed 50,000 people wow. and do that in New York City on land on one of the islands that are off in the river, for example. So that sort of thing is getting started. And I think it's just a matter, it's a matter of the fact that most problems, I think, are solvable. Most solutions are fairly simple. And the science, which we know so far, is enough to get on with trying some of those solutions. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Thank We've you. got two minutes. And if we could bring up the lights for any questions. <laughs> Giant clams is what he's mentioning. Most people think of giant clams as a very ancient animal, must take years and years to grow. They are the fastest growing of all shellfish. 
they grow also from, uh, the, the thing that makes them grow is not what they filter, they get something out of that, some nutrients and so on. But what mainly happens is they get sunlight uh, it, 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 hit, hitting their mantles, and in their mantles there are a series of algae called zooxanthellae, which produce amino acids directly into the bloodstream of the clam. So this is the only autos autotrophic, self-feeding farm animal that exists. Mm -hmm. The funny edge to the clam's shell is really an adaptation to increase exposure to sunlight of the mantle of the clam. They are but they, so fast do they grow, and so prolific are they, that a single event, they have both sexes in Tridacna, which is the biggest one. They have both sexes, and what happens is that the clam turns on and releases sperm for a while, then shuts down, and then a <laughs> hour or so later, it opens up and starts releasing eggs. And a typical event of releasing eggs is, well, 500 million eggs. And now there are techniques in Australia which have been developed just on the reef off Townsville, where they are raising up to 18, excuse me, 18 million of these clams that can be, uh, get large enough to be put out onto the reef. You put them in under cage wire, not very high technology, and they grow, and in about four years, you have something that weighs 35 pounds. You sell the meat for over $100 a pound, and uh, hasn't been done. And uh, I mean, it's, sorry, it's been done experimentally, but there was no major industry for it. It's been tried in a couple of places, but that was very early. A lot of the problems are worked out of it now. <laughs> Roger, Roger, David Brin here. Uh, I was wondering about a practical uh, advice for all of us. Uh, first off, do you approve of tilapia, which is vegetarian? And second, I'd like your thoughts about ocean seeding. Some of the experiments done with iron have obviously been pretty silly, and yet obviously the uh, winds that blow sand off of the Arabian Peninsula into the, um, into the Western um, Indian Ocean and all that obviously do have the effect of seeding the ocean and creating vast uh, biomes there. So is it possible that we might be able to either stir ocean bottom or, or find ways of taking some of the vast desert areas of the, of the ocean and, and, and turning them with a little human assistance into, into uh, productive biomes. Roger, just to say, we're out of time. Mark, can we answer that or do we have to do that? Yeah. yeah it's, um, I think the thing that saves me from having to answer that, as you said, is it possible? The answer is at the moment not enough is known. I think it's a piece of mischief. That's my feeling. And I think that we should make the same effort on trying to do things like educating women and making the means of birth control freely available. You don't tell anybody to use it. You just say, here it is. If you want it, use it. If you don't, don't. That's your business. It's not mine. And whenever you do that, no matter what population you do it to, no matter what culture, you find that the birth rate starts to fall. And I think I'd rather see the money spent that way so that we don't have to try these completely uh, uh, scary methods which might have appalling consequences. So, Roger, thank you for being a truth teller and a prophet and for acting in the world. Thank you very much. Okay.